the leopard just sat there, froze, didn't move a muscle looking at us. Then suddenly it dropped down on all fours on its belly and it crept along the ditch and out of sight. And everyone just looked at each other in disbelief thinking, wow, was that real what we just saw? You say, well, I've seen this big cat, and some people just flatly refuse. They think that Britain's such a sweet little island, we shouldn't have predators that size. I heard this growl behind me, nothing like a dog's growl. And just like anything else in life, you're sat on your own there. I don't care who you are, how brave you are. Something like that will put the shivers up your spine. As she was walking before the cub came out, she flicked this tail. She literally flicked it in the air. And I simply could not believe what I was seeing. It was the most extraordinary feeling. It threw its head back, he said, and it made this sort of round. But when you actually realise that there are big cats living in Britain, it changes everything. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. Why are unofficial big cats being seen and could these cats even be naturalising without us knowing? If you've had a big cat encounter in Britain and would like to discuss it, email me at rick at bigcatconversations.com. You can find other episodes on the website bigcatconversations.com. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of Big Cat Conversations. For this show, we're going to be hearing about several encounters and sightings in Scotland from our guest, Paul MacDonald, who is based in the Borders. And Paul's discussions will take us into different parts of Scotland and across several different issues. We've got plenty to discuss, so we'll get down to business now. And Paul, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And can we start with your very first encounter, I think, which is many years ago. Was it in Glenfinnan? That's right, Rick. It would have been about 1986. And I was raised in the West Highlands, and the, the wee village I was in was 35 miles from the, the nearest high school. So it was a bit of a trek in and out every day. I used to get the bus and then the train and then walk in the last bit. And so on that daily train journey, myself and my friends would keep an eye out for deer that you, you often saw in any other wildlife. And we were actually were going across the Glenfinnan viaduct. The train was travelling from west to east, and we were almost at the extremity of the eastern side of the viaduct. And there was the unmistakable shape quite close. I mean, no more than, I would say, five to ten metres at very most beside the train sauntering away as though the train had startled it, but it wasn't too bothered. It wasn't running. It was an unmistakable shape of a, a very large dog-sized big cat, dark brown in colour. Mm. How many people saw it? I think there was only myself and my friend in that carriage at that time in the morning. Mm. Um, we don't know if anyone else in the train saw it. We didn't ask about it at the time. We literally stopped in mid-conversation to, to watch this, and it was quite a close and clear view, I would say, for possibly about five seconds. Then the train went into the tunnel. <laughs> we just looked at each other. So, did you see that? Yeah, did you see that? Yeah, and it wasn't wasn't a deer, was it? No, it wasn't a dog, was it? And um, I'm sure I've heard previous interviewees on your podcast say that when you see a big cat, especially close, it's unmistakable. You know exactly what it is. And having a second person for verification and discussion and to swap notes is very helpful, isn't it? Yes, yes. Paul, is that the Harry Potter? Is that the viaduct on the train that's in the Harry Potter film? Yeah? <laughs> yes. It's yeah. now more famous locally, or um, on the tourist trail at least, as, as the Harry Potter Bridge and the Harry Potter train. Of course, it was known as the Jacobite steam train before that. Yes, yeah. I mean, I've actually been to a Highland Games at Glenfinnan, and they, they have yeah, the, yeah. They, they have the um, people dressed up as Jacobites. It's really quite feisty and um, impressive. And yeah. I have actually done a family walk on holiday under that viaduct. It is a wonderful area, and you get the train, the steam train now, going on. It's full of Japanese and American and British tourists. It's mm -hmm. quite a scene, but uh, quite an iconic place, of course, now. It is a full history, and it's about 20 miles from the nearest urban environment, you could say, mm. Fort William. So it is quite, you know, it's, it's certainly out in the sticks. 
At that time, Paul, you hadn't had any thoughts about big cats in your lifetime, is that right? No, before that, that was certainly my first sighting. And, of course, I started asking about after that. Mm. I would ask any gamekeeper that I met and um, a lot of the farmers. And, uh, of course, the stories just started coming out in the, the local area. Yeah. Just quickly back to that one that you saw. If you had to nail it to a specific species, what would it be? And could you give us a bit more description on it? I would class it as a curious one, um, a puma possibly, but one detail about it I remember was the long tail, the, the size of the body and so on. You, your, your eyes are trying to take in as much detail as possible. But I remember thinking that it seemed to have longish hair, mm-hmm. you know, longer than you might expect on a mountain lion. Or such. Mm. Not a winter coat, perhaps? Possibly, yeah, possibly, mm. possibly just that. Mm. But it was, it appeared to be quite a, you know, a middle, middle to dark brown colour at the time, and we saw it quite clearly against the lighter, long highland grass that you get up there. So it stood out in contrast quite well. It certainly wasn't black, but that's mid to dark brown. Okay, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting that some of them don't tick a specific box. That's an important discipline for us, isn't it, to stop always wanting to categorise them as a black leopard or a puma or a lynx. Was anything particularly characteristic? You said long hair. Any other characteristics stand out? Nothing other than that. It was, it was walking with a very characteristic big cat gait with his head down. And like I say, it was sort of at a, at a light pace, you could say, moving mm. you know, move, moving away from the train. It wasn't the hind quarters we were seeing. We were getting almost a side-on view yeah. of it going from our right to left in directions. So it was moving in the opposite direction of the train. And the scale, if you had to compare it to a Labrador or a German Shepherd or whatever? We both agreed it was Alsatian-type size. That alerted you to the concept and prospect of big cats being around and you became attuned to them. And I guess the sceptics are now going to say, yeah. oh, this guy you know, is now going through his life looking for more big cats and finding them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we carry on with that background. So we are going to hear more yeah. sightings, aren't we? So, yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I certainly was actively asking you know, landowners and gamekeepers and farmers and the story started to come out when you ask. turned out there'd been sightings either side of Loch Shiel in the Arasag area, Fort William area, um, for quite a wide spread around the Lochaber mm-hmm. area in general. Lochaber area is, well, you could say, about halfway up the West Highlands, just south of Skye on the coast. So around that area, the stories just started to, to come out. Yeah. yeah. And what was all this telling you? Were they mainly Black Panther types and Puma types that you were getting... Yeah, quite a lot of sightings of black, large black cats, and, and there still are, of course, up there. There's been large black cats sighted quite recently a few times in Fort William, almost encroaching into the urban areas of Fort William, which is just interesting. Did you find it tricky to sometimes ferret out a response from people? I mean, that's often the case, that people are a bit guarded about releasing information. I didn't find it too difficult. I found the folk were generally quite open about it. If they'd seen something, if they knew it was a big cat, and they would just tell you if it was either a yes or no from, from anyone else. Fair enough, yeah. So we move on to Edinburgh, don't we, next, with the next full-on encounter that you experienced. Is that right? Yeah, Edinburgh's probably the closest encounter I would ever wish on anyone, really. Mm. And this was backed up by two friends at the time, and would have been about 10 years later, been about 1996. I found a great interest in fencing at the time. Never had the chance to do that in the Highlands and started the university fencing club. And so it was with two friends involved in the fencing club that we decided, as you do as a student, that it'd be a great idea to go fencing up a hill <laughs> at midnight, have a bit of swashbuckling adventure. <laughs> Brilliant. These days you'd put it on social media to prove the point as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. day before iPhones and yeah. probably early days of mobile phones. Yeah. But yes, we were over up a hill called Arthur's Seat, which is right on the edge of Edinburgh. You could say it's almost in the middle of the town. It's kind of on the outskirts of the, the centre of Edinburgh. Another iconic place, Paul. Very much so, yeah. It's a beautiful spot. You can walk up there and look right over the River Forth and the city itself, and, and you don't feel as though you're in the city. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. Mm. We decided to go up and do a bit of sabre fencing at the old ruined chapel for a greater dramatic effect, I suppose. Yeah, wow. And it was a moonlit night, I remember. I'm not making this up no. for added drama. Uh-huh. It was just as it was. 
and we were there possibly, time-wise, probably about 10, 15 minutes, something like that. We were taking it in turns between the three of us to fence with fencing sabres back and forward right beside the ruins. I remember my girlfriend at the time was sitting with her facing in towards us and towards the walls of the chapel and where we were fencing. And she turned round first as we were fencing. We didn't hear it at first. I remember I stopped and said, what is it? Is it OK? And she said, I heard something. It sounded like a growl. And so, of course, all our minds first imagined that there's a dog walker out and there's a dog. Then we all heard it again. And, of course, the distinctive growl of a large cat is remarkably different and gives you a very sort of guttural feeling as well, I think, when you hear it close. And we stopped what we were doing at the time and we started to pack. And as I was packing, my friend and girlfriend saw it first and they kind of let out some, something in exclamation. <laughs> I was looking around to see what it was as well and I saw it also. And I saw, what, I, what I saw was the head silhouetting against the contour of the hill, which was, was just black. And the eyes flash a silver colour. Mm. Now, when they both saw it, they described exactly the same thing as well. And it growled again, but closer and louder this time and it was certainly again I would say it was it was possibly around the 10, 10 to 15 metre mark in terms of range from us but the growl was absolutely distinct you, you couldn't put it down to anything else yeah. the shape of the head also was very distinctively large cat but unusually large also it looked larger than you would imagine a, a big cat head to be which frankly scared us all mm, mm. and we bolted off that hill <laughs> very vivid memory. I'll never forget it. I'm sure all three of us won't. And we bolted off that hill after that experience. It struck me as just being completely out of place because it was so close to the middle of town. And I thought, OK, I, I'd already arrived at the understanding that big cats could survive and breed quite happily throughout the British Isles. But this just seemed completely out of place. And the size of it also struck me as strange. Mm. So the, the following morning, I went to visit a friend in Edinburgh who runs a shop who's very, very clued up about matters in terms of spirituality and legends and, and folklore and so on, and described exactly what happened to him. And he confirmed that there was a, a legend that was known on Arthur's Sea, on the, on the hill, that was a big cat that was a spiritual guardian of the chapel, the ruined chapel. And it seems that we'd awoken it in some way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I thought, well, that's interesting. That seems to tie in with what we experienced but also opened my mind to the idea that was it something more than a, a physical cat a physical beast yes it did growl you've heard the vibrations and yes yes very clearly yeah yeah i know that from having a preliminary chat with you you do take this in a very sort of normally empirical logical scientific way um but mm -hmm. so you're saying you don't discount other theories in terms of other experiences and you just keep an open mind rather than scoff at anything which goes beyond the science we know perhaps yeah yeah i think you could say that i think i've always had an open mind from a fairly young age I experienced a poltergeist when I was 13, mm -hmm. um, which opened my eyes and my mind somewhat. It showed me things, you know, physical objects moving unsupported, clearly in front of my eyes, which a young inquiring age certainly makes you ask a lot of questions um, about the natural world, you know, and the supernatural world and mm -hmm. lines in between. So I've certainly always been open to, to these things. And yeah, it made me think, OK, maybe there's something more than physical big cats existing why can't there be both ghosts of humans and ghost dogs and so on are well recorded through history so why not big cats in some way it seems that there are legends through a lot of ancient cultures that way too yeah what i've picked up from people who advance the theory of them being interdimensional animals, interdimensional creatures, is that people with that view tend to see that as the exclusive mm -hmm. conclusion about this. You know, there's no other explanation right. other that if right. they're out of place than they are interdimensional. Whereas you're saying you think they could be zoological and interdimensional. Absolutely. Just to qualify, I'm not suggesting for a, a shred of a moment that everyone's seeing interdimensional beings out there. Not by any means. I believe that that type of encounter is, is an absolute rarity as much as seeing a ghost in front of you would be. 
these things are experienced throughout the world in different ways, but I'm quite open in my mind in thinking that both things exist. But the majority, of course, I think of what big cat encounters and sightings in this country are empirical, are scientific, are physical beasts Yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's a wonderful legend, isn't it? A, a spirit sort of guardian of an old iconic building in an iconic location. One could argue, well, it could be a legend based on the fact that there has been... <laughs> cats around there because it's a good place oh, derelict buildings are good places for cats to shelter could be said but that there's at least three folk in scotland who can confirm to very close proximity yeah. <laughs> of something very real up there yes the idea that it's a spiritual guardian as well i, I found fascinating because mm. in researching the idea of big cats and their place in ancient cultures of course you, you do see these stories come up and worldwide too, in geographic areas where you've had big cats for thousands of years, then the mythology, if you want to call it that, also goes with that in the culture with big cats, Mm. that they are connected to the underworld, they're connected with transformation, they're connected with with witchcraft in some ways as well in certain cultures. Mm. And the ancient Greeks had their own mythology on it. In China and Japan and Egypt, you had goddesses that were feline or part feline, part human. And they were guardians also to the the other side that way. So, And they were able to move between this side and the other. And the Buddhists have a, an understanding that the snow leopard is the guardian of the spirit world that way. And the Mayans also understood that the jaguar was a beast that could move between this world and the other world that way. These legends have originally come from the idea of seeing a big cat move at speed, which is it's something phenomenal. It's like it's a move like water. It's, it's almost otherworldly that way. Whether they started that way and became something deeper ingrained in the culture, I'm not sure we can answer that. But you do see ideas of big cats being guardians and or being able to transcend this world and the other across the world. And it will be interesting in a future episode to have a folklorist on discussing the black dog observations and theories in Britain because some people would advocate that actually that is potentially a black cat that people were actually or theoretically experiencing. So, Yes, yes. I've known people where that's come into their lives that way. The black dog spirit as a, a prophet of someone in the family dying is quite a common one in Scotland and Ireland. Okay. In Scotland, you have in the place names sometimes Case Ness as the place of the cat, and that's where Clan Hatton was established, and Clan Hatton was the clan of the cat. And it was the first confederation of Highland clans, which is a challenge in itself to get enough Scots working together as, uh, <laughs> as, as, as an effort. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> this was a confederation of clans known as Clan Hatton, and their clan motto was Touch Not the Cat with a Glove. That's a reference to the Scottish wildcat, presumably, the European wildcat in Scotland, yeah? Yes, more than likely, yeah. Yeah, and I should say that we will be interviewing in the future uh, people with experience in researching Scottish wildcats, very important aspect to include on the podcast in the future. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Now, we, before we leave Arthur's seat, we need to look at the police experience there because it was in the press and then it was removed from the press. But the police had an yeah. incident there at a similar time to you, didn't they? It seems to have been an incident in 2006. And there was a missing person search going on in Edinburgh and it was centred around the hill on Arthur's seat. And a piece of footage circulated briefly online and it was taken from the, the police helicopter. It was thermal footage. So they're hovering over the search efforts. And one particular piece of footage very, very clearly shows a, a female officer from above engaged in the search. And she's uh, she's walking from left to right on screen slowly. And there's not far in front of her. You can see she's walking towards a long heat signature that's very cat-like in shape. And you can hear the radio communications as well between the officer in the helicopter and the female officer on the ground. And the officer in the helicopter clearly instructs her to stop walking that direction, which she does, turn around 180 degrees and walk that way. And she follows the instructions accordingly. And very shortly after, this long cat-like shape gets up and moves a little bit towards her, but then turns around itself about 180 degrees and walks off that way. But you can tell from the shape of it and, and the detail as well, but enough that you can see from it, that it's absolutely, it's not, not just a big cat. 
it's an abnormally large cat. And then, curiously, even more curiously enough, that cat signature disappears. So it's a very strange piece of footage. And Yeah, but then I suppose you could argue cats are really skilled at just um, making themselves disappear. Sure. We might think physically, but actually, you know, they've just vanished because they're clever and stealthy. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely could be said. And it could be said that it's, it's disappeared into a cave and then, boom, the heat signature's masked from view. Or gone the other side of a couple of trees or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it does stand out, again, as a, an abnormally large cat. Yeah, and you get the dialogue. The police dialogue sort of confirms all this, doesn't it? I remember at the time. I raised this recently on a, the cat forum on Facebook and a couple of other folk came out the woodwork to say, yes, I saw it as well, and I saw it as well. So it's definitely been seen and heard, and apparently it was uploaded by a member of the air crew on Live Leaks, and it was um, very shortly removed after that. So there's no trace of it online today, and mm. unfortunately the official police line is that the footage never existed. I have to say, I thought it got mentioned in the press somewhere, so maybe there are some press reports. It did, and um, the story did. Um, in fact, one of the officers in the helicopter was advised by superiors to actually speak to the media about it in 2015. But he refers to the incident taking place, or the media refers to the incident taking place in 2012, whereas it appears to have actually happened in 2006. Well, thanks for that, Paul. I know we've got tons more to chat through, so we better get motoring on to something else. Now, could we talk about the suspicious carcasses that you've been involved in investigating with somebody else? I mean, I know you want to keep the location vague, and I think that's quite right and proper, but that's live at the moment, isn't it, that one? Yeah, it certainly is. This is regarding local sightings here in the Scottish borders. I can say it's Peeblesher area, and this was following off the back of a sighting in just last October where a local was driving along one of the back roads and clearly in front of his car saw a large black cat, described it, size, shape, and it was on a road that had fields on the right-hand side of the driver and forest on the left. And he described it on the road, walking towards him, and it saw him, turned to the side and disappeared into the forest. Immediately after, I contacted him and he was happy to meet up and show me exactly where he seen it. Took me to the spot and we walked to exactly where he saw the cat because he recognised it was beside one prominent tree to the side of the road. Then there was a very clear run into the forest. So we ventured in and I turned left and within a short distance, maybe five metres or so, there was a skeletal remains of a roe deer. Fairly fresh and that the bones were still white and there were still signs of sinew, the vertebrae still attached. And then I walked in the opposite direction, found some more bones and some more. And in all, I've identified at least ten skeletal remains, not all of it fresh, most bones green, I would say. Mm. Signs of um, scraping on the ground also. And I ventured to the field opposite to find some prints, and um, about two inch by two inch, so not a huge cat, but certainly big enough cat, possibly about three foot body size. And yes, yeah, so there seems to be something going on now, so I obviously set up a trail camera there and managed to identify some feral cats operating in the same area with that, but no big cat images yet. OK, and I've asked you to check those skeletal remains for toothpit impacts, which we could, if you find any triangle or or any toothpits, really, that seem to be from a large mammal, they could be investigated and checked at the Royal Agricultural University lab for their ongoing study. They'd be delighted to have more samples from different areas. You're also a metal detectorist. And I was saying to you when we were sort of doing the recce for this interview, I've only just recently heard of a report of a big cat sighting from a metal detectorist. And it's a type of activity, when people loiter in the countryside for a long time in their activities, (laughs) whether it's work or pleasure, they've got a chance of seeing a big cat. And metal detectorists would often be quite quiet, I'd imagine, with their headphones on and things. And you were saying you have heard of one. Yep, I heard of a couple to date, but one made its way quite recently, about two, three months ago, onto one of the metal detecting sites, and somebody said they were out by themselves one day, open field, as detectors often are, and they, they were down digging and caught something at the corner of the eye, looked up, and yep, large black cat, but a large black cat down in something of a crouch position and making its way directly towards them across an open field. So it was a bit of an alarming encounter for them. They realised the danger. Basically, they made some noise and smacked the spade on the ground to make enough noise and, and size that it scared it off. Yeah, wow. That was a complete surprise, and it was a large black panther-type cat. Yeah, they described it as panthera-sized black cat. 
Yeah, before we go on to the documenting of historical reports, just tell us quickly about your main job in life. It's going to be fascinating for people to hear about, I think. I run a wee armoury based in Edinburgh and I make custom swords and knives and also teach traditional swordsmanship, European martial arts as well. That presumably makes you interested in detail and precision. So that's why you're interested in data, is it? Is there a link to what's coming next about documenting, logging stuff very carefully? Yeah, I'm always engaged in historical research. And my aim for making arms is to make historically accurate arms. And the only way you can do that is to study the originals very closely. With that, you're also gaining an understanding of the historical context, the martial historical context of the weapons, where they developed from, where they maybe developed into something else. And it gives you a broader understanding of the subject in the end. But what you always find with history is detail is important. And so you're constantly analysing for detail with physical objects as much as the historical accounts. Your work is sometimes bought and and procured by film sets and wealthy people for heirlooms and that sort of thing, all all manner of commissions, is it? Yeah, there's a bit of a mixed market. The the swords are pretty much all custom work, mostly all individual pieces, making for exactly heirlooms and people wanting very specific historical reproductions, occasionally for museums and the occasional TV production, and do quite a range of knives and the military side as well for military personnel and military collectors too. Wonderful. We'll put a link to your website. You've got examples on your website. Yes, yes, I do. That's kind of easy. Okay, so on episode 16 on the website of Big Cat Conversations, we'll put a link to that. You've been at this for many, many years in your life in terms of Big Cat encounters and ferreting them out and following up and talking to witnesses. And you've logged quite a lot and you're interested in what that historical trend can show. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. But it's only quite recently, 2019 there, that I've had the opportunity to engage a bit more hands-on with the the local environment. I'm sure you know it's endlessly fascinating. Yeah. There are some people I know who are not so interested in past sightings, but I feel they can tell you a lot. I mean, it's helpful if they do build upon more recent sightings because you're thinking, hang on, what's going on here? Especially if these people don't know of each other's reports. You've just got this trend information of independent witness reports and you've got to weigh how credible they are. But yeah, I mean, tell us more. You do feel that that historical trend information is valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Historical sightings are very important because these are the sightings that are confirming that it's not just a recent phenomena and that big cats are quite happily over generations and many generations surviving and breeding quite happily. And that's the more important sightings in that respect, I feel. In my first sighting was around 1986. And when I started asking about the area, then people are saying, oh, yeah, there's been one round here for years and so on. So, you know, it, it makes you wonder how far back these animals have been around and, you know, how well naturalised they actually are. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about naturalisation in a minute. I'm always interested, especially if we get them earlier than 1970s, the mid-1970s, when it's assumed that it was a key source situation with an event from the, the Dangerous Wild Animals Act which led to releases. But as people have heard me say on the podcast, the wartime would have been episodes of releases because of the difficulty of supplying meat to these animals. But Also, if it was a rag bag of reports of all kinds of different (coughs) colours and shapes and sizes of cats, then that wouldn't be so compelling. But when you're getting the same kinds of descriptions, same colours as well, although you often get different colours, blacks and browns in the same area as well anyway. But again, it does help, I think, build the case, doesn't it, that they seem to be naturalising. It does. And following on the the most recent site here in the borders, I started to compile and collate all the the local stories as far as possible and there's at least 30 sightings I think that are on that at the moment Mm. and hopefully I'll soon have access to some more research that's been done before I move to the borders by another local fellow who's who's unfortunately passed away now. Derek, his name was Derek Nicholas. A result of knocking on doors as you do and and also through the local Facebook group as well and the stories were coming out and several folk kept saying you should have met Beric, he was the man, he was the big cat man in the area that was doing all the research and apparently he'd been doing research since about the 1980s all around Peebleshire and Midlothian area, gathering sightings and going out after sightings and finding prints and taking casts and so on, and scat, and evidence gathering essentially. Very good, because there's many people around the country like him. 
It had many equivalents, and it's nice to mention <laughs> somebody like that. But you were telling me, Paul, that he actually himself never had a sighting. Is that right? Yes, been told by his family, yes. Yeah. And uh, I think was always out there looking for one as well, you know. Yeah, because it's, it's often an encounter, a personal encounter, which actually feeds that motivation, isn't it? So it's very interesting that he mm-hmm. was obviously highly motivated and highly dedicated to it, even though he'd not had personal experience. Yeah. But uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and often, and presumably, yeah. he won a lot of people's trust. If he was getting information, you can only do that when you get people's trust and people see you as credible. Yeah, he must have done, and clearly known a lot of the farmers and so on around here, which has an actively metal detecting around this area. Also, you have to naturally engage with a lot of landowners and farmers that way too. And so it's usually something I'll throw into the conversation and ask them if you ever seen or heard of any big cat sightings around the area, and of course. Whenever you ask, the stories are there, the stories will come out. Yeah. And uh, and the stories seem to span at least 40 years from my own research around here. Yeah. That's including cats being hit by vehicles, one skull of a big cat, at least, that I know has been found in a forest nearby. So, yeah, it's a bit more than just the odd sighting, it seems. And what are the reports? Are they standard black panther types and puma types or...? Yeah, invariably around here they do all seem to be large black cats and all reporting panthera sized mm. cat sometimes seen leaping up considerable distances. A couple of sightings often seen up trees also as well. Okay, yeah. Very interesting because the borders itself nationally, UK wide, does not have much of a profile on big cat sightings. It seems to sneak under the radar. So it's great to see that you're taking on the baton from his work and you're settling there and getting onto that grapevine and seeing where it leads. It's fascinating to have the opportunity to engage hands on with sightings and with an area where you know the sightings have been and an area of concentration of sightings. It's quite exciting. I've maybe <laughs> carried on the, the constant hope and expectation from Beric that way, I, I would hope, <laughs> for my own black cat sighting around here one day. Yeah, yeah. Do you meet resistance? Do you think there's some people who think, yeah, this is awkward, I wish this guy wouldn't poke his nose in on this kind of subject? That has been raised, I would say, on the local Facebook page after the October sighting. And some people said, oh, you should just leave him alone mm. and not mention anything about it. Yeah. And it was out of concern for protection that if you put the word out too much then there's going to be farmers landowners gamekeepers perhaps that might just want to go hunting them i find that some of those people are the very people who like to keep it quiet for other reasons and we shouldn't think that they naturally are inclined to want to take the gun to them there's all sorts of people's attitudes and people don't fall into easy categories i find actually yeah but i would say in the whole that the those attitudes towards them were actually that they were for the preservation of the cast they weren't naysayers or disbelievers that way. Yeah, sure. I mean, some people, I think, just don't want it investigated or the investigation to be sort of very public because they just don't want to fuss and they don't want an attention on, on the area on a difficult subject full stop, regardless of an attitude to protecting the cats. Yeah, you have to be that. Well, we're now going to hear about an experience of yours in Canada and you're going to make me eat my words because in episode 11 we heard from Gareth who was a witness in Gateshead near where he lives. And before that, he'd seen one in Florida, Puma in Florida. And I said at the time that I guessed he would be the only person or one of the only people who'd ever seen a big cat like a Puma in its native country and in Britain. And here we are just a few episodes later, and you're going to counter that with this amazing experience in Banff in the Rocky Mountains, wasn't it, Paul? Yes, it was. Yep. This was in Banff in Canada, on the West Highlands of Canada, you could say where they have significantly higher hills than we do. And this was over late December, early January, going into 2010, I believe. And so being winter, it was a beautiful area. I'm sure at any time of the year, but uh, winter, so it's incredible. And I was over there for a, a European martial arts and stage combat workshop, which lasted a whole week in the Arts Centre in Banff, which is situated in part of their national park. So on day one... All the participants received a brief on general conduct, but also what wildlife they could expect to encounter because there were no fences uh, fencing off the the art centre that way. So deer would sometimes come down in the morning, that sort of thing. They generally knew where the large bears were, but we weren't in any danger at that time. But they did mention that mountain lions roamed and were sometimes known in the vicinity. And they even referenced that a few years previously somebody had been killed and 
they would used the word murder, which made me question what the motive of the cat was. They made it quite clear that we just had to be aware. So everyone was briefed. And one of the classes I was teaching there that week was on World War II military combatives a couple of years earlier, along with a colleague had established a, a World War II living history group. And we specialised in the original training disciplines of the commandos and such. I was into the military fitness at that time as well, which during that week, I got into the habit of expunging the evils of the previous night by uh, <laughs> getting up early, drinking some water and going for a run in the minus 10 or so degrees. But a dry cold, so more bearable. And I would do this in my denim World War II uniform as well, just for a bit of authenticity. Every morning I was doing this quite happily. And I would run maybe about a mile and a half down to the local high street and then back again in the snow. Absolutely beautiful experience in the morning and freshened me up for the day. I'd done this for, I think, four mornings running. And running back this particular morning, it was still low light levels early morning. And I'm running uphill. And on the left side of the path, there's a forest. On the right side, there's one or two small houses. And one of the houses has a porch light on that's spilling light across the road in front of me. So I'm running forward. And from the forest to my left spills out this dark shape that stops dead in the path directly in front of me. And it's unmistakably a large cat at a range of probably about 25 metres from when I first sighted it and I up dead and was staring straight at me. I didn't stop running, though, and that was very much, I think, a conscious decision. Um, as I realised, the options were well, either stop, either run away, or keep running towards it. And running towards it just seemed the more sensible option. Running away seemed the worst idea. Even standing still didn't seem a good idea. So I kept going towards it, and thankfully it did turn tail. I'd already drawn my... Fairburn Sykes fighting knife from my side was the idea that at least got one claw <laughs> in a fight if it came to it mm. then that would be all the advantage it could muster I wonder if you'd have run towards it if you didn't have your knife your dagger implement it must have made you feel a bit more confident in doing that yes but only marginally I would say mm. I, I certainly knew on a claw ratio between us I was certainly outnumbered <laughs> <laughs> yeah not half yeah. it was only I think marginal inspiration <laughs> to keep going forward. I think regardless of knife, I, I would have kept running forward. What was my first idea was, this is the only way I can scare that off. Yeah. By going that way. How would you describe its movement when you first saw it? Breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking in the, the graceful fluidity. I mean, it, it spilled from the forest. The shape spilled from the forest down the steep bank onto the, the flat road in front in absolute graceful fluidity like like water mm. I was breathtaking that way the beauty of it mm. until the moment I realised exactly what it is and there was a bit of imminent danger that way yeah it was just a coincidence that you were converging both of you were converging presumably yes I wasn't tracking big cats uh, mm. I, I certainly wasn't looking for any close encounters being out by myself in the morning so it did come as a surprise it just stopped because it didn't want a confrontation with you presumably I can't speak for the cat itself as to what was going through its head. It stopped dead, and so I had a full side-on view of it as it clearly had its head looking towards me. Mm. So, yeah, it clearly just caught my movement and stopped in its tracks to see what the next step was. Yeah, and it's interesting you use the word fluidity and fluid movement like a lot of witnesses do, and that's very different from a dog's movement, and a lot of witnesses in Britain do make a point of emphasising that. If they don't use the word fluid, they use words to that effect. And Yeah, some dogs can be a little more graceful than others, but <laughs> not quite to the level of a cat. There's a beautiful, graceful movement to cats, especially at speed. Mm. That was the first thing that really almost took my breath away. I still get excited by seeing deer or seeing a buzzard fly in the sky, and they're quite common. Yeah. This is just, it was a breathtaking moment. Yeah, I wonder if it had been spooked to be going that fast if it wasn't obviously pursuing something, because there's got to be a reason. Normally they would just saunter and walk confidently to conserve energy, but it's running for a reason. I didn't see anything it might have been chasing. There wasn't anything else that I saw immediately around to determine why it was it was moving so fast. But yeah, yeah. it turned tail and, and was back into the forest. I kept running on for about the last mile with my head on a swivel, looking <laughs> towards that forest every couple of seconds, thinking, well, this thing could be tracking me now, because I couldn't 
the light was still dim enough that I couldn't see too far into the woodblock itself. Eventually I got in, thankfully safely, and uh, reported it in to let folk know that a big cat had been in the vicinity that morning. Yeah, I mean, it's quite an experience being super alert, isn't it, in that way? Yes, 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 you're very much on edge. Was it a textbook puma, mountain lion, would you say, sort of adult and looking the normal colour and normal size and everything? Yeah, the range was 25 metres in closing. I would say it was 4 feet to 5 feet in the body, excluding tail. How lucky. And of course, as we say on the podcast, many people, most people in the native countries of pumas and leopards don't see them and wouldn't expect to see them. So you've probably seen something that many residents in Banff itself had not seen, even though they're all around. I did feel rather lucky, but startling also when you realise that there's nothing between you and a large beast like that. OK, we better get on to Word of the Week, and it's always nice when the guest is going to help me out with the Word of the Week rather than I have to do it as a set-piece middle of the programme. So we're going to talk about naturalising. I guess most people know exactly what naturalised animals are, but the official definition in biological terms is a plant or animal establishing wild in an area where it is not indigenous. In fact, in my book, I quote a very good book by Christopher Lever called The Naturalised Animals of Britain and Ireland. And I'll put a link on the website under episode 16 to that book. It's a splendid book. I think there's two editions, a few years back now, the second edition. He makes the point that a naturalised animal in Britain would need suitable habitat and climate, a vacant ecological niche, an adequate relevant food supply... An absence of predators that would make it vulnerable, would make that species vulnerable. So there could be predators, but it would be used to those kinds of predators, so it wouldn't be vulnerable to them, for example. Uh, Fecundity, ability to breed in a viable way, and a sufficiently large founder stock. So those are all the conditions that he sets for a a naturalising animal. What are your views, Paul, on all of that and, and these cats? We're talking about historical sightings feeding into the idea that it helps confirm naturalisation. My view is that big cats seem to be quite naturalised in certain areas of the country and don't seem to be adversely impacting human activity. And this seems to come out when there's discussions on the topic where it's rare, I think, to find folk who are really against them in some way. And the attitudes do seem to be more for the cats and for preservation and protection measures, which could only be a good thing. There has been talk in Scotland, certainly, of reintroducing certain breeds. And we know that beavers have been successfully reintroduced in Persia. But the talk of wolves has been on the cards for some time. It's not happened yet. Part of the reason for that is a bit of public fear. When you mention an apex predator potentially on your doorstep, then the fear is the first thing that people take from that and think, oh, I'm not sure we could deal with that. I'm not sure that's a good idea not realising or understanding that we've got a fully stocked larder outside in most rural environments Mm. and they would survive quite happily and live quite happily. And the big cat behaviour seemed to be that they'll only take livestock when they're either desperate or training the young that way. So it's rare that we're finding that they're not exclusively living off them and they're certainly not decimating entire stocks of livestock. It'll be the occasional piece that's taken. Yeah, I'm with you. And I think the podcasts are implying that a lot of that is backed up. But what I would say is that if you occasionally meet somebody who is desperately having problems, they need help and they need advice and it's not fair to leave them in the lurch. So I do think the response to the fact that we have big cats here needs to include assistance in some way. That could include financial as well to people who are taking a hit that is really affecting their livelihood. We have discussed that actually from our other guests from Scotland so far in this podcast series. I think it was episode five, wasn't it, on sheep impacts from a crofter lady in North Scotland. So we do need to think about people who are impacted. But it's interesting, isn't it, that if we said to people, oh, there's going to be a government programme or a wildlife conservation programme of releasing and achieving a viable population of black leopards and puma conchola pumas across the British countryside, I mean, there would be uproar. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. (laughs) But because it seems to be a random event and it's sort of happening, Mm -hmm. 
awareness of it is very up and down and sort of incremental here and there and people don't think of the bigger picture because it's a, just a local issue for a lot of people. It's something which people just live with and tolerate and even sort of embrace and so that is intriguing mm-hmm. isn't it? But I think this point back to this naturalising thing I mean you feel just that historical data is proving that they are viable and that, that yeah. we can we can yeah. regard them as naturalising and, and, and possibly adapting you know they are resourceful and very generalist in their behaviour they have to adapt to a lot of different environments in there in the native countries so why not here yeah i think the more understanding that's getting out there about the cats throughout the country i think it can only help overcome the initial shock and fear and ideas of being scared of having the cats or wolves Mm. as part again of our, our natural environment they're helping redress imbalance in terms of deer populations and such and mm. providing a, a very natural part of our ecosystem that used to be there yeah the links our former native links perhaps links are out there naturalizing quietly on the side as well as part of this equation and relation to the bigger the larger cats that we think are naturalizing here perhaps is that they're all in a way that in the same ecological niche they are the deer killers of the ecosystem so functionally they mm-hmm. are culling deer okay and rabbits and pheasants no doubt and occasionally sheep so they're mm-hmm. all a parallel medium large carnivore in the ecosystem and it may be that they can coexist yeah, yeah, and you know, keep certain populations down, like rabbit populations, for example, if they go to excess, then end up with all sorts of problems. Yeah. A lot of species, and of course, they're going to grow to excess, and also they're more competing for food in their own environment at the same time, so it's very natural redress to imbalance. Yeah. Lovely. Well, it's been splendid to have another guest from Scotland and we will return to Scotland as much as we can through the podcast series. And I know you've introduced me to a guy we're going to have on in the near future. People who want to network with you about the situation in the borders, we'll put your contact information on the link, perhaps an email address or something, Paul, so people can look on the website. Yeah, quite happy for that. Lovely. Okay. Well, I'm really grateful for you for covering all that rich range of information and sightings. Paul, good luck with your work in the borders and keep in touch and thank you for coming on Big Cat Conversations. Thanks so much. It's an absolute pleasure. OK, before we close, just a couple of announcements as usual. We're back in Scotland again in three or four episodes' time and that edition will include discussion of jungle cats which have been seen in the area we're going to talk about. They are native in large parts of Asia. We've not mentioned jungle cats yet in the podcast series, but they do get reported in Britain, and I've seen and heard one myself. They are not a very large cat, and they wouldn't be able to predate a deer, but we certainly ought to mention them. Meanwhile, for our next episode, we'll be hearing from two different farmers, one from Wiltshire and one from Cornwall. One is a sheep farmer and one is a cattle farmer. Finally, I want to say another big thanks to all the Facebook groups that help to promote the podcast. We're really grateful for that help. It's a vital part of getting the podcast noticed. Okay, we're done now. Time to sign off. Thank you for listening, everyone, and hope you can join us next time. Bye for now.